Tonight we have a really um, uh, top level presentation on TAP. And so I will get right to the business of introducing our speaker, uh, the Dr. Uh, Fatima Jackson, professor at Howard University. I, before I uh, go into that a little bit further, let me remind you of what uh, Maynard has already said, and that is that we uh, welcome your questions, audience questions, um, after the presentation. In fact, after the presentation, we will have a response offered by Rob uh, O'Malley, and uh, we'll introduce Rob in due course. But uh, once uh, Rob has made a few uh, observations and uh, posed the first question, we will open up the conversation. But uh, look for the button down at the bottom of the screen, uh, Q&A link there. Just open that, type your questions in, and then I will moderate those questions and present them to our speaker. The title for tonight's presentation is Coming to America, Evolutionary Consequences of the Atlantic Trade in Enslaved Africans. Uh, difficult, a very demanding, and very sensitive topic indeed. And so I'm delighted that we have probably the most qualified speaker we could imagine uh, to uh, help us think through uh, this difficult question. And that is uh, the Dr. Uh, Dr. Fatima Jackson, professor and biology and a director of the Cobb Research Laboratory at Howard University in Washington, DC. Now she is um, an expert in uh, genetics, as you might imagine, uh, having uh, studied and received uh, various degrees, including the PhD from Cornell University, uh, published uh, over a hundred technical reports and articles. Uh, she's held uh, academic posts at the University of North Carolina and at the University of Maryland. Uh, she was honored in 2020 with a, the, the, uh, the award of the Charles R. Darwin Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Association of Biological Anthropologists. Uh, now, as you can imagine, given the topic that she's going to be addressing, which indeed is, is her life's work at this point, uh, it is multidisciplinary in its very nature. And she combines uh, various approaches to interrogating uh, the, uh, all of the sources of data to try to understand the meaning of biological diversity across uh, the uh, US population, the New World population, as it relates to ancestral populations in Africa. Uh, she is indeed the foremost expert on the topic of the uh, uh, genetic variation that occurs in, um, uh, in and as a result of the uh, diaspora uh, brought about by the transatlantic trade. The um, consequences of genetic mixing, uh, she's going to be addressing that particular topic uh, as, as a part of her conversation with us tonight. Consequences as a result uh, uh, that, that, bear, that bear results even today in medical approaches to uh, customizing uh, 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 medical treatment for individuals. Well, it's a long and complicated topic and she will guide us through this uh, expertly. Uh, I wanna offer to you now, uh, Dr. Fatima Jackson, speaking to us once again on coming to America, evolutionary consequences of the Atlantic trade in enslaved Africans. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, Ron and Maynard and also the Institute, the IRAS. I'm very honored to be, have been invited to give a webinar um, this evening. And I thank you all in the audience for, for um, participating in this. So I've got some slides I'm bringing up right now. Um, as we talk about the Atlantic journey, which most of our ancestors made, um, we have rarely thought about the evolutionary consequences. And yet, when we talk about evolution, 
we often speak of it as if it's not happening to us right now. In fact, we are all evolving. And um, the idea of change, we always say in Islam that everything changes except God. So, so the change is a normal and, and necessary part of existence. So I'm very pleased and honored to speak to you on a topic that I've been concerned with for quite a while. And this is in fact why I came to Howard University to think uh, more clearly about legacy African-American evolutionary biology. That is what is happening evolutionarily to populations who have spent maybe 16 generations in the Americas, 400 years or 16 generations. So when we talk about ancestry, we, we often fail to realize that ancestry is at the root of much of what we understand about all these fancy terms like precision medicine, epigenomics, transcriptomics, genomic entropy, intra-diasporan vari variations, mathematical and ecological modeling, proteinomics, metabolomics, pharmacogenomics, phytochemical coevolution, and even gene environment interactions. At the root of all this, and these are fancy terms that are, I like to think of them as up in the trees, the actual root, the, the, the uh, stem and the root of these disciplines are in ancestry. If you don't know ancestry, you can't do any of these fancy uh, applications. And since we're all very concerned with precision medicine and developing medical interventions that are fine tuned to our biology, um, if you don't know the ancestry, it's gonna be very difficult to uh, accurately address the precision medicine that we're gonna need in the 21st century. So I'd like to talk about genetic variability in legacy African-Americans. And you may wonder, who are these legacy African-Americans? Well, it's uh, th these are African-Americans who have endured uh, ancestrally the legacy of American slavery, uh, Jim Crow racism, discrimination, segregation. And it's that legacy that has shaped both the genetic variability in terms of the genome but also the epigenome and also the microbiome. So all aspects of our biology have been modified by the American experience. And of course, that's true for, for any group of people who've been here for an extended period of time. Now, the origins of legacy African-Americans are primarily in West and Central Africa, uh, but also we're finding that there are some lineages that have roots in East Africa and in South Africa. So the greatest source of admixture is really intra-Africa. That is uh, admixture between groups in, that in Africa, they were separated, but once they were brought to America, once uh, uh, representatives of those groups were brought to the Americas, uh, they had mixed. There was gene flow. People fell in love, got married, and reproduced. And we also know that legacy African Americans have modest gene flow with non-Africans. And that's very important. Although it's been overemphasized in the literature, it's still an important source of diversity. So the main North non-Africans that have been the sources of this modest gene flow are North Atlantic and Iberian Eurasians, that is Western Eurasians or Europeans, as well as Eastern and Southeastern Native Americans. That is the um, uh, original populations of the Americans. They came in contact with the progenitors of legacy African-Americans and there was gene flow between the populations. Now, there are also significant non-genetic sources of variability, and this varies by geospatial region. 
And honestly, we've yet as evolutionary biologists done our homework to really look at the range of genetic variability in legacy African-Americans. And which is why I'm, I'm so excited about uh, the chance to, to investigate this and, and to develop new insights because I think that legacy African-Americans can tell us a great deal about microevolutionary processes and how populations conform and modify their environments and conform to their environments so that they can optimize their existence, even under the most perverse um, situations of enslavement and disenfranchisement, people still sought to optimize their existence. Now, this is the status of our database, uh, our reference database currently in 2022. We have an inadequate reference genomic database with respect to peoples of recent African descent. So here is a chromosomal portrait of an African-American woman. You can tell it's a woman because here are two X chromosomes and they are from West Africa. <clears throat> That's what the coloration means. But you notice that there are a lot of unassigned and uh, inadequately referenced areas, the gray areas, okay? And um, in fact, 64% of her genome is unassigned to any geographical area. And although she is African-American, we know more about her European, the blue, ancestral genetics than we do about the limited Sub-Saharan African or specifically West African uh, background information. We also notice that the East Indian, uh, excuse me, East Asian and Native American contribution to her genome is fairly small. And we can tell how long ago there was that admixture by the size of the genetic fragment that is currently retained in this individual. So we know more about her European ancestry, 20% of which is European. The Sub-Saharan African is only 15.8, but that's because our database is so weak on peoples of African descent, the recent African descent. And we have huge areas that are unassigned to any geographical region and or for which no data currently exists. So that you know give, tells us pretty much indicts our genomic databases in terms of their adequacy for reconstructing the ancestry of peoples of recent African descent. Uh, when we look at the substructure in legacy African Americans, we see that really they are a subset of Africans living south of the Sahara Desert. Um, African Americans are here in this purple. This is a um, uh, uh, this is a principal component uh, depiction, principal component one, two, and three. And then these populations are simply um, uh, 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 identified in terms of their proximity to each other relative to these principal components. So these are genetic and sometimes phenotypic traits, protein traits that we say, well, where does the population rank with respect to a protein along this axis or this axis or this axis here? And African-Americans are a subset of Sub-Saharan Africans, but not all Sub-Saharan Africans because here are the Hazda people of Tanzania. They are a hunting and gathering population and they're kind of outliers, as you can see. Um, North Africans uh, in this study cluster more with Western Eurasians, but Central and Southern Eurasians are separate. And uh, Oceanians, Eastern Eurasians, uh, uh, East Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, um, and Native Americans are on their own tangent here. 
And if you notice the admixed Cape Town population in Southern Africa is also a subset of Sub-Saharan Africans, but with more Western Eurasian admixture than we are seeing in African Americans. So if we look at the complexity of African peoples, uh, we find that much of that complexity is deeply embedded um, and in them and in their uh, American descendants. So this is North Africa. This is um, a, a depiction of the genetic variability. This is Western Africa, Southern Africa, African Americans, and then Yemen. Yemen is serving as something of an outlier, although it has affinities to uh, people in Eastern Africa, as you can see, okay? Particularly this individual here. So um, as we look at this, what we can tell is that uh, African, African Americans have a large component from this orange or yellow area, which is common in Western Africa, also in parts of Southern Africa, and in many parts of Middle Africa, which we would call Central Africa. Uh, but there's also uh, genetic influences from uh, what looks like the, the non-Africans in Eurasia. And that's a small component here. So African Americans are clearly an African population, but separated from the large bulk of African diversity. And you all will recall that humankind originated in Africa. So in a sense, we are all Africans. It's just some of us left the continent more recently than others. So some left a very long time ago, you know, 80,000, 60,000 years ago, and others have left more recently. And so the African signal is still very pronounced in African Americans. When we look at the points of origin of African Americans, uh, we know that the contribution from various sections in Africa uh, depends on where your ancestors arrived. If they arrived at the Chesapeake Bay, well, 38% of the Africans brought to the Chesapeake Bay came from the Bight of Bonny. This is southeastern Nigeria, and these are largely Igbo-like peoples, but you have 16% from West Central Africa. Now, when we look at the Carolina coast, 40% came from West Central Africa. From the grassland areas there, these are are big rice growing areas uh, in West Central Africa, in Angola, Congo. Uh, but we also have a good proportion from Senegambia and from the Upper Guinea coast coming to the Carolina coast. And in the Mississippi Delta region or the, the lowland Louisiana region, uh, West Central Africa is only 25% of the population, Senegambia 32%. But the Bight of Benin, 25%. And that, that's very culturally significant because the Bight of Benin is the home of Voodoo. And which is why in the Mississippi Delta region, we have the strongest signal, uh, religious sig signal of Voodoo in the population. They, they came with their cultural um, orientation and sought to implement that cultural orientation in the Americas. Uh, this is just a, a table showing some of the points of origin and the, the countries today that relate to the African points of origin. Uh, but what we have been finding is that a group coming from say the Bight of Benin, which is uh, near Ouida in Benin, but the people are coming not only from Benin and from Togo, but from Nigeria and from Burkina Faso. In fact, they reach far into the interior and then were brought inland. So the slavery began in Africa. They were kidnapping began in Africa as a product of wars. And then the populations of enslaved individuals were moved to the coast 
where they were loaded onto European and American ships for transport to the Americas. But the transatlantic trade reached deep into the, the bowels of the continent. <laughs> and so we expect to get to capture a great deal of variation, not simply the variation that's on the coastal areas that were the, the exit sites. Of course, uh, Madagascar and Mozambique were good examples of Southeast Africa that participated in the transatlantic trade and contributed significantly. Now, where are the bulk of legacy African-Americans currently located in the United States? Well, this is a map from 2020, and you can see that the large proportion of African descended Americans are in the counties of the same states where there were the big plantations. So although we tend to think of legacy African-Americans as primarily located in urban areas, the fact is, is that the majority are still in the South. And uh, you have the Mississippi River here, so all along the, all along the Mississippi, and then um, uh, this whole southeastern area all the way up to Chesapeake Bay um, and uh, Washington, D.C. being right around here, okay? So we have done in my laboratory a case study of legacy African-Americans, and we've chosen the Gullah Geechee people of the Carolina coast as a case population because we think that they were one of the first groups to emerge from the transatlantic middle passage. That is the, the middle passage that transported, captured and enslaved Africans from Africa to the Americas. And that middle passage uh, was a, a source of great misery, uh, great mortality, and certainly a great deal of morbidity, which acted as a selective pressure on the population. But the Gullah Geechee were one of the first groups to emerge from that uh, hourglass, as it were, that bottleneck of the transatlantic middle passage. And their presence influenced other legacy African-Americans in North America, particularly around the area of the Carolina coast. And so other legacy African-American micro-ethnic groups often can trace their original affinities to the Gullah and Geechee peoples. So we call them a progenitor population for other legacy African-American microethnic groups. We find in the Gullah Geechee a greater retention of Africanisms than many other legacy African-Americans. And so they become an excellent model to track uh, the microevolutionary patterns over time. Um, so the, the retentions are both genetic as well as cultural. And so it's a, a, it provides an interesting a case, a case study uh, for tracking microevolution in living African Americans. And these are the Gullah Geechee people. That's a very nice and friendly picture of, of a people currently under duress because of the um, loss of their land, uh, because Hilton Head has become a very desirable and expensive place to live. And so the Gullah Geechee are losing this traditional land that they've held for centuries. Now, a lot of times we see misrepresentation of the genomic complexity of legacy African-Americans. So we, we see that uh, researchers simply lump together all uh, West Africans and they, we uh, confuse them with Bantu speaking populations and so this is an example of uh, where researchers are not able to make distinctions between African-Americans in Chicago, even though most came from, from Mississippi, five counties in Mississippi, or Pittsburgh, or Baltimore, or North Carolina. And uh, it's really unfortunate because inside these categories, these broad 
uh, categories, there is a lot of embedded variation. And we have been looking at that complexity. Uh, and I, I used to wonder why was it so difficult for my colleagues to recognize substructure in African Americans? And I think that um, when you recognize substructure, then you're, you're actually paying attention to the people or the population that you're, that you're focused on. Um, substructure means that you're looking for small differences that may signal variability in ancestry, variability in susceptibility to health disparities, and we found lots of diversity that's gone unexplained in the literature or until recently. The actual complexity is in the structure of the genome. It's in the structure of the epigenome, which are the, the chemical markers that are in association with particular genes and that will amplify the signal of a particular gene or repress the signal of a particular gene. The structure is in the microbiome, the microorganisms that make up the majority of our DNA and have a, a tremendous impact on all aspects of our biology and behavior. In fact, just this morning, uh, one of the research groups that I participate in, there was a discussion of how the gut microbiome influences neurological processes. So, so really, you know, the way that we're thinking our attitudes, our feelings of depression or elation are also very much reflected in our microbiome. And the gene-gene and gene-environment interactions are all part of the actual complexity that needs to be taken into account. So what I want you to understand is that we are moving away from this uh, genocentric view of uh, diversity and beginning to understand that multiple interactions are occurring, that there's networking, that the interactome is much more important in determining susceptibility to disease, not simply having a gene or not having it, but it's how does the genome interact with the epigenome, interact with the microbiome, and how do these interactions uh, facilitate uh, increased susceptibility to disease or decreased susceptibility to disease? So the case study that I'd also like to present to you is of an, two alleles, the G1 and G2 allele in the APOL1 uh, system. So the APOL1 is the gene, and it has two risk alleles, G1 and G2. And these risk alleles are associated with chronic kidney disease. Now, many of you know that there are major health disparities in these United States, and that many of the health disparities follow uh, uh, ethnic racial lines, socio, socio racial lines, and economic lines. And what we're finding, though, is that the APLO1 gene has two risk alleles that are, were very adaptive in the African context, which is probably why they rose to high frequency. The G1 allele is very common in Western and Central Africa the G2 allele in Eastern and Southern Africa. The G1 allele provides or used to provide some protection against trypanosoma, trypanosomiasis, which is a fluke, a, um, uh, a, a protozoan uh, uh, organism that is in the blood and it's the cause of sleeping sickness. So there are two kinds of sleeping sickness African sleeping sickness. There's the one caused by Trypanosoma brucei gambiensis. That's in Western and Central Africa. And then there's a Trypanosomiasis that is caused by a more sylvatic or forest reservoir 
that is caused by trypanosoma brucei rhodesiensis. And the G2 allele seems to protect against that second form of trypanosomiasis. So what, how does this fit into African-American microevolutionary bio, micro biology? Well, prior to the emergence of these genes, the populations were separated in Africa. Eastern and Southern African populations commingled. Western and Central African populations commingled. But between those two groups, there was very little interaction. In the Western and Central populations, the G1 allele emerged in response to Trypanosoma brucei gambiensis. In Eastern and Southern Africa, the G2 allele emerged in response to Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiensis. Now you bring representatives of those populations to the Americas, they fall in love, mate, reproduce, and we get people who are double heterozygotes, G1, G2, with almost assuredly chronic kidney disease. And there's a reason that African-Americans have very high rates of chronic kidney disease. Part of it, of course, is environmental. Part of it is legal and political. But a good chunk of it also has to do with the genetic composition of this admixed African-African intra-regionally admixed population in the Americas. So the genomic data provides enhanced diagnostic information for clinicians. It can be the basis for preemptive interventions through gene environment and gene-gene interactions. Um, and we're, what we're trying to consider is how can we modify these genes and the risk alleles so that they never produce chronic kidney disease. These are just some of the biomedical ramifications. Um, the uh, APOL1 gene expression uh, produces these abnormal or unusual alleles. I shouldn't say abnormal because they're quite normal in Africa where you've got trypanosomiasis. But where you don't have trypanosomiasis, uh, they have a protein that is able to lyse uh, lipid layers. And so what these genes do is that they cut into the kidney and they destroy the podocyte. They destroy the, the structure of the kidney so that uh, the kidney is not able to function efficiently. Uh, they also are found in the liver and in the heart, uh, but we don't know quite what their impact is in the heart. Uh, we think they might be uh, contributing to arteriosclerosis, coronary artery calcium, uh, but it's hard to determine because some of the calcium uh, abnormalities are a function of the dysregulation of the kidney. So uh, it looks like there's also another gene, a nearby gene, APOL3, that is involved. So the APOL1, G1, and G2 combined with the APOL3 to produce CKD, that's chronic kidney disease. So we have a better understanding of the renal risk variants and the uh, uh, discrepancies in health disparities for kidney end-stage kidney disease by looking at the legacy, the historical legacy of African Americans and understanding what the American experience has newly created for these legacy African Americans. This, by the way, is the human African trypanosomiasis. And you can see its size relative to the red blood cells. And apparently what the proteins 
of those APOL variants do is that they lyse it. So they're able to cut into the uh, trypanosoma. And as they cut into the trypanosome, uh, the trypanosome becomes inviolable. So the G1, G2 double recessive heterozygote is the uh, example of a disruptive, disrupted adaptive interaction facilitated by interregional African African gene flow in the Americas. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but what we're saying is that one of the one of the alleles common in one part of Africa is able to hemolyze the the pathogen. The other allele is found in another part, a different part of Africa. And remember, Africa is huge. You can fit five continental United States within one continent of Africa. So uh, the two trypanosomes don't overlap, except in a place called Uganda, which is in eastern central Africa. And uh, in Uganda, the two parasites occupy different ecological zones. In America, they come together. So when I was looking up coming to America on the web, and I, I found this poem by Phyllis Wheatley, and I'm going to recite to you her 1773 poem, but I also have a response to it. Uh, she wrote a poem in 7, 7, 1773 on, called On Being Brought from Africa to America. And she said, "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God and there's a savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. Well, that was Phyllis Wheatley in 1773. And as they say in the South, God bless her. But I wrote my own poem that I'd like to share with you, or maybe it's a rap. Maybe poems, maybe raps are poems, I'm not sure. But here's mine. Dear Sister Phyllis, it is from African empires and kingdoms in shackles we came, unaware of the magnitude of the European colonial game. Enslaved, disenfranchised, lied to and lied about, generations of depraved conditions indeed, no doubt. Yet we rise like the phoenix to overcome great odds. Resilience and tenacity have been our stalwart. So the correct story of the involuntary journey from Africa to America can now be told using history, genomics, and evolutionary biology. Behold, our past is noble, our future bright. The application of honest, unbiased scholarship can set things right. Kidnapped from a homeland, from the homeland of humanity, we arrived in the West. Our culture and biology permeate its success. So no longer must we cling to misconceptions of our worth. Indeed, great insights surround each of our births. Illuminating our true story leads to an appreciation of all we have faced. Changes in our epigenome, microbiome, and genome have allowed us to keep pace. So documenting our microevolution devoid of vanity emancipates you and me and all of humanity. <laughs> so that's my response to uh, dear Sister Phyllis Wheatley, 1773. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And I look forward to your, your questions, comments, and suggestions for improvement. God bless. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I have a feeling we're going to want that last slide up again. Uh, so don't, don't, uh, 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> don't let it get too far away. But thank you. That was just uh, wonderful, uh, terrific. <laughs> and I'm sure it sparked a lot of questions, although right now I don't see any questions in the Q&A line here. Mm -hmm. I see one person trying to put questions in chat, but uh, better to put them in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. So let me encourage all of our listeners to, um, to go down to the bottom of the screen where it says Q&A, open that up, type a question in, and uh, we'll make sure it gets uh, the, uh, brought into the conversation. First, however, though, we're going to go to a uh, response uh, to the presentation we've just heard. Our respondent is uh, Dr. Ra Rob uh, O'Malley, and uh, it's been my privilege to get to know him in the context of his work with the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, Science, uh, a particular division there, uh, Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. And uh, Rob is now serving as the director of that particular program. Uh, it has uh, many uh, projects in the works, um, and uh, he, he may uh, take just a second or two to describe some of that. Um, but uh, he, he will be speaking to us in response out of his expertise, first of all, as a, an anthropologist and evolutionary biologist. He spent uh, time in field study in uh, Tanzania uh, and in Costa Rica. Uh, and he is the author of uh, numerous uh, journal articles, including the Journal of Human Evolution and other comparable journals. So Rob, if you will appear magically here on the screen, uh, we're going to go to you. Yes. Okay, there and, we go, thank you. Okay, um, so uh, first, uh, thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you, Dr. Jackson, um, for that great presentation. Um, <laughs> did it's, you like uh, rap? I did, I did, I thought it was great. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I want to say it's it's one of the absolute pleasures of my of my job uh, at AAAS has been to get to know uh, and opportunities to get to know and to learn from scholars like like Dr. Jackson um, and their and their research team um, and their their because uh, science never occurs in a vacuum um, you know great scientists uh, work work with others in collaboration um, uh, they have students who go on and, and carry on their work. And uh, I was, I was, uh, I, uh, Dr. Jackson uh, noted an, a publication by herself and Dr. Jen Caldwell. And Dr. Jen Caldwell was actually uh, an intern for uh, Dozer uh, many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I was pleased to see she got a, uh, she got a shout out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm not a geneticist. Um, my work, as as Ron mentioned, um, was in Tanzania. I studied wild primates, um, and I can talk about some interesting colonial legacies there as well because um, there are some interesting stories to tell. Um, but I thought in my response, I would kind of put on my public engagement with science hat uh, instead, um, because I'm not a geneticist. Uh, and uh, as, as Ron mentioned, um, I work at AAAS in the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, which has as its goal uh, the idea of fostering communication and engagement about science between scientific and religious communities, recognizing that these often overlap. Um, and have many areas of mutual interest and concern. Um, so that's very much kind of my my focus is is thinking you know more broadly how do we how do we have good constructive conversations about science and its impact on society um, that are inclusive of, of faith perspectives because of course most people on Earth uh, claim some religious identity. Um, and if you go to AAAS, if you go to our AAAS headquarters, right on the wall, right when you walk in, on big big bright blue letters, it says. Um, as our mission under the AAAS logo, advancing science and serving society. And that's a very lofty goal. And it's one that I think about a lot, uh, in particular, the second half of that, serving society. Um, because the honest truth is that for much of its, for, for much of the last many centuries, um, you know, even before we had something that was formally called science, um, very often the, the practice and the exercise of science and the applications of science only serve some of society. That very often um, science and its practice and this incredible power that it wields in society um, serves some interests and some concerns, often entrenched concerns. Um, and 
and that's a reflection of the fact that science is a is a thing done by people um, that it always has a historical context it always has a social and political context science is not neutral um, you know we aspire to to be objective and to be mindful of bias in our practice of science but it is it is fundamentally it's done by people and it's it's impossible to escape those um, elements of, of who we are completely and in thinking about uh, Dr. Jackson's presentation and, and her, her broader body of work and the type of engagement that she does, what really shines through, I think, and, and this was referenced, I think, at several points in her presentation, talking about data structure and talking about, you know, thinking about um, uh, the implications of, of certain uh, uh, genetic alleles that maybe are of higher fraction in, in African descended populations and others. It is really critical to be mindful and reflective of the impacts of what questions are being asked, mm -hmm. who is asking, what is their frame of reference, how is data being interpreted and used, how is data being, how is, how is science, the practice of science being funded, you know, which institutions perhaps are getting resources to pursue certain questions and which institutions are not getting resources to pursue the questions that they want to. Um, and this is especially critical, I think, to be very mindful of these elements of the practice of science. When we're talking about origins, when we're talking about ourselves and our, the relations between uh, ourselves and our environment, but also relationships among different groups of people, um, we do, of course, all humans on earth do have uh, a, a very recent African origin. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we know that people do, do differ and disentangling the complexities of the variation that is real and the impacts of racism mm -hmm. and the impacts of colonialism in different populations and different populations of health, uh, you know, the, the, the health challenges of different populations, that is a really, challenging and it's, it's a fascinating topic but it's also it's a really challenging topic because exploring that work has historically been used to do harm to many communities that you know concepts of human difference and concepts of human variation historically has been leveraged to do harm um, in very extreme cases of course in terms of genocide but but also in very subtle and insidious ways as well, in terms of, for example, modern health disparities. Um, so in a time when I think we as a society are grappling with trust in science, trust in institutions, whether we're talking about scientific institutions or otherwise, and even just trust in each other and, and you know, thinking about things like human difference and like the very central element that, that you know, differences among people, you know, whether that's uh, uh, genetic, ethnic, language, racial identity, you know, racial identity, religious identity. Um, we really have to be willing and able, I, I, I would say, I, I encourage us all to be really willing and able to think about topics like these, the ones that, that uh, Dr. Jackson raised, the historical and ongoing impacts of who we are and, and what we've done, and in, you know, in the case of, of, of you know, white Americans, the, the, the legacy of, of uh, the transatlantic slave trade and the impacts that that continues to have on uh, uh, black Americans, African Americans and other legacies of colonialism on, on communities of color. We have to confront this legacy fearlessly and honestly and with humility and being very mindful of, 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 that, of that legacy in the doing of science and the impact that this has on science, because science is not is not a neutral endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I guess, uh, so that's, those were my uh, comments. And I thought that I would just um, open with a question um, to Dr. Jackson, um, which again is really centered on kind of my role at AAAS, which is thinking about public engagement with science. Um, these, topics, as, as you know, Dr. Jackson, are so 
can be very fraught, I think, and very challenging to engage with, even, even for scientists who have a lot of expertise in genetics and, and studying you know, human origins and, and, and human health. What would you like to see institutions or individuals be doing to sort of broaden the conversation, the constructive conversations that, that must be happening around ancestry and genetics mm -hmm. because people are talking about it and it's not always constructive right. and so I, I my so my question is what would what would you like to see happen to make these conversations broader and more constructive and again thank you very much for that chance to participate in this oh. conversation oh sure thank you dr o'malley you know i will admit that it's hard to talk about slavery and i can only do it in a few of my publications because it takes such a toll and yet we have to confront it it's such a deep part of our legacy as americans that i feel that until we take this boulder out of the road we're not going to be able to move forward um i i think what I'd like to see is I'd like to see more studies done so as to truly understand um, what it has done and what resilience has also been manifest. Because we talk about how enslavement and kidnapping and the torture and so forth, and that's all very oppressive and it's true but it's not the whole story. There is nuance and our ancestors had nuance in their interrelationships. And I believe that, that as, we, as we investigate this, we will find that nuance and it will be the salvation for this nation. Because I hate it when things are painted in broad strokes, black and white. Um, there's a lot of wrong that has been done. But as my grandmother would always remind me, a lot of people did things bad, but there were some good people too. And you know, you have to, I think that that's where our belief systems come in because most, most um, sophisticated takes on the major religions recognize the complexity of human behavior and that there is, there are no walking human devils, just as there are no walking human gods. There, there's nuance and diversity, and there's situational goodness and situational evil. And um, I think understanding that allows us to find the trap door to get out of some of the 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 the, the, the hardships that we have encountered and thrust upon each other you know um at the end of the day we're going to have to to be forgiving but you can't forgive unless you understand what it actually transpired and why it transpired and you know and that's how you find a way out and that that's what's important to me you know because i'm I'm an American. I'm a strong believer in the best aspects of this country. And I want us, I want us to win. <laughs> but I want us to win not at the expense of other people, including, you know, other black people, but not at the expense of, of Native Americans, not at the expense of Asians, not at the expense of poor white people. I I want everybody to win, which probably makes me more of a socialist than any. <laughs> Whoops, <laughs> there goes my funding. <laughs> but, but you know, honestly, we, we, we have to confront the good and the bad and the ugly in our history so as to overcome it. And we have to be mature about it. We can't sweep it under the rug and say, well, we're not gonna talk about it because it makes us feel uncomfortable. Sorry, sorry, that's grow up. That's what life is about here. And the sooner we can impress upon people the, the mutual responsibility that we all have for each other, 
I think the, the better off we're going to be. And now, you know, no, anything that we do is not just limited to this American society. It influences and impacts the entire world. So now is the time to address the past and not make the same mistakes that we've made in the past. Um, we can make new mistakes. <laughs> And we don't even have to go to Mars to make the new mistakes. <laughs> so, so yeah, what I would like to see is more research. I'd like to see those, those gray areas filled in with a representative and conscientious effort to study Africa in the way that we have studied Europe, you know, with the European genomics. And um, I'll, I'd like to see the application of sound biology to our studies of human diversity worldwide because if we do that then of course there's a natural and and primary place for africa because as you mentioned it's it's our collective homeland by the way i didn't know um dr o'malley that you had spent time in you you did tell me that you spent time in tanzania but that's a connection that we have because i also yeah. spent three years there um it's I don't know if you ever felt it, but I always felt in Tanzania that it was a very old place that people had solved some of the problems that we're still trying to solve here in the West, like how to get along with people. You know, I had I had a, a colleagues uh, from Germany. We were all in Tanzania together and we had a big argument as Germans and Americans love to do argue. Right. And what were we arguing about? Whether East Germans were really like West Germans, <laughs> were they all Germans or not? And uh, you know, it's, and then we then it transpo it transferred into white Americans and Black Americans, and the Tanzanians among us said, "Aren't they all sons of Adams?" So what any And you know, it was like a slap in the face for all of us. It was like a wake up call that what was really important is that we're all human beings, not that some are brown, some are black, some are tall, some are short, some are white, some are pink, you know? No, that's not what's important. What's important is we're all sons and daughters of Adam. And for this village person to say that in the midst of, you know, our raging Congress, I think we were arguing because it was boring and that we did that for fun, <laughs> but, they, the Tanzanians took it seriously, and yet they came up with a, wa a wisdom that put everything in proper perspective, which we need to recognize. And that's the best of religion does that. It provides a proper context so that we don't go overboard, so that we, we think of the fairness in our science, you know, and we think, well, so what's the impact of this research on the least among us, you know? Thank you so much. I, uh, we've been listening for the past 45 minutes or so to uh, Dr. Fatima Jackson and uh, Rob uh, O'Malley, Dr. O'Malley from AAAS, posing uh, some comments and questions. Uh, just a wonderful answer there uh, that um, uh, we've, we've heard in response to uh, Rob's response. Rob, I'm wondering if you've got any kind of follow-up, just any very precise um, response that you want to make at this point. Uh, I, we're ready, I think, just about to open it up to the wider audience, uh, and questions are beginning to come in. But uh, Rob, um, anything from you first? Sure. I mean, I, I think I, I would say uh, she hasn't, she, we're talking more mostly about genetics um, in, this, in this presentation, but I do want to uh, call out and, and acknowledge and honor that you know Dr. Jackson is is really leading broader a lot of broader conversations in in the field of biological anthropology, so study of sort of the biology of human people, about how do we do this work more ethically. Um, there is such a legacy in this field of that Dr. Jackson and I are both a part of of biological anthropology, of of horrors basically of mm. of just absolute nightmarish behavior and the most unethical things you can imagine scientists doing, riding out into the wilderness 
at the site of massacres and lopping off the heads of it's, people yeah. to collect for collections and just mm -hmm. and and I, I I I think I I think that that what's really a lot of these conversations are overdue mm -hmm. um, and I do think that there is a which is unfortunate, um, but they are happening and that's good. And as you know, some progress is good progress. And I, I think that there's a, there's a real openness, I think much more than perhaps than there used to be about letting people bring their whole selves into conversations about doing ethical science. And, and um, I, I will say, you know, I, I am not a person of formal faith. I, I identify as an agnostic, but like, I, I see value in in making space in the practice of science and thinking about its application, in trusting people and, and, and giving, whether they're scientists or not, um, opportunities to participate in meaningful ways with discussions about how science is gonna be done. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not doing that, and including, and very much explicitly people of faith, faith leaders, um, thinking about, you know, uh, uh, ethicist theologians, because if we're not willing to do that, what is it for? What is it for? If we're not willing to make sure, be responsive and, and active in making sure that people who are impacted by this work mm -hmm. are included. Mm -hmm. And so that, and I, and I, I just, I'm, I'm so grateful for the labor that, that Dr. Fatima and others are doing to, to push our field, but also science more generally into, into more ethical spaces and practice because it, it is, it is, it is overdue. Yes. So I, I guess that's my, that's my response. Mm -hmm. And any, any comment, uh, Dr. Jackson? Well, I would just, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. O'Malley. I mean, you know, um, there's no roadmap. You just have to do what, what is in your heart. I'm, I'm a believer that people are basically good and then they transform themselves to be bad. That's what I think. It may sound kind of Pollyannish, but it's what I believe nonetheless. I want to see the good in people, and I feel that people basically want to do the right thing if you if you kind of give them that opportunity. So, I I have been trying to to take it as far as I can go um, with my science, with my interaction with students, with my interactions with colleagues, because. As far as I know, I only have this one life. And I really want it to count. Um, not that I'm trying to live forever, but I want whatever good that I do to count account for me so that I can have a good next life. <laughs> so that's where my very practical beliefs come in. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I can't save the world, but maybe if I could save one person you know, from falling off the cliff, the cliff of racism, sexism, homophobia, mm -hmm. religious intolerance, and other colorism, and other kinds of stupid distractions that we as a species tend to be, to fall for wholeheartedly. You know, if I can do that, I feel like if I can, can avoid that in myself and in others, then we've got a chance at persisting into the 22nd century yeah. but it's it's a it's there's no roadmap right. and you just you you have to you just start off with a set of assumptions that there is a way out that there is that there there is that exit door that's been provided and that we can we don't have to go down with the ship the ship of racism homophobia sexism you know, and other kinds of isms that work against the best of our human traditions. Um, and so that's, that's, I'm hopeful in that way and try to bring the science that will, that will, will create opportunities like that. 
I want to do the same thing after I retire with um, um, this genre called Afrofuturism. I want to mm. take the science that I know and then kind of twist it a little bit in ways so that it's accessible to the masses, you know, but that they also can see the the potential problems or the irony in certain things like like the the man who recently at the University of Maryland was given a pig's heart and uh, they had genetically modified the pig. But lo and behold, the man died from a pig virus. We weren't even looking and thinking, you know, we were so sure that our transformation of the pig heart had been so complete that it wasn't really a pig's heart. But, you know, it really was a pig's heart. And the pig virus recognized it right away. And we weren't even scanning for the pig virus that killed the, the individual. You know, so I feel like there's a story in there. There's a story that could be used to, to, to teach people about the continuity between species and yet the distinctions between species as well. So anyway. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Let's uh, begin to turn to some of the questions that have been queued up here. And I actually want to start with the very first one that came in on the Q&A. Uh, once again, reminder to everyone, uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to jump into that Q&A box. Uh, your questions might have to do with some of the technical terminology that uh, Dr. Jackson has used. I have questions along those lines, and I may pose some of my own, um, but your questions could be at that level or more along the lines of uh, what uh, Dr. O'Malley has suggested, uh, thinking at, at, at kind of the grand uh, social uh, level um, and, and uh, the, the, the moral uh, guidance of, uh, of, the, of the scientific research enterprise. But the first one kind of uh, takes us in the more detailed uh, direction it's a, it's a reference to the television program, Finding Your Roots. And I'm, I wonder uh, whether, I, I mean, uh, Dr. Jackson, I don't imagine you sitting around home much uh, without, uh, with a television on, but you, you, no doubt you know this show and I'm, I'm sure you've heard. Oh yeah, people. I've been on it. Yeah. I, I was on that show. Oh, okay. Uh, All yeah. right. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. So, uh, so your assessment of the science as it is presented there, and then uh, without expanding the question hopelessly, um, your assessment of some of these other, uh, what, the, the, these, these retail genetics operations, uh, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, that kind of thing. And uh, uh, the, the original questioner asked how that links maybe to the gray areas. You remember, I think it was like your third slide or so. Right, un, right. Un, um, unsequenced portions. Right, uh, okay. right. So uh, that's, that's a huge question, but uh, take it away. See where you want to go with that. So, so um, what I would say is that these companies, uh, these are uh, public presentations like Finding Your Roots and African Ancestry and all, those, those are basically good because they, the Nova PBS series, it's good because it conveys scientific information to the public. As long as it's accurate now, Sometimes we've seen in the early days with some of the commercial genetic companies that the results that they gave were, um, well, that's, we call them recreational genetics because it's for recreation. It's like, you don't want to, you don't want to uh, divorce your husband because he always said he was Irish, but now you find out he's not. <laughs> So, no, because there are no Irish genes, German genes, you know, whatever. We do know a lot more about Europe than we know about any place else in the world because most of the people participating in these studies and indeed the reference database to which they're being compared is Western European, North Atlantic European. So if you're North Atlantic European, you're in great shape. Your money will be well spent. They, they, these commercial companies can even tell you what village your people may have come from. If you are African or if you are most Asian with the exception of East Asians, um, if you are Native American 
uh, these databases are very weak and they're not, so therefore you can pay your money and you'll pay the same amount as any North Atlantic European, but you will not get the same quality of results because the reference database is not as strong. How do we fill in that reference database? By sending out researchers and putting government NIH money into the development of those databases. So uh, H3 is an NIH endeavor to look at genomic variation in Africa. Uh, but we should have, it, it's, it's a little too little, too little too late, as they say. You know, they, they should have done that long ago because we've long known that human origins were in Africa and that human diversity, all human diversity is a subset of African genomic diversity. <laughs> so that's not being Afrocentric, that's being human centric. You know, that's just how it is. And to me, I wanna tie this back to religious belief because have you ever noticed how you can always tell a Monet painting from a Van Gogh painting? You never confuse the two, right? Because every artist has their own style. And the unity of humanity is to me a manifestation of the oneness of humanity and the, the fact that we are, mon we, are a sort, we are derived from a single creator. And that single creator created all of us. And he, he used basically the same template with minor variations as he moved across the geospatial spectrum. You know, most of the variation that we focus on is fairly recent in evolutionary terms. It's, it's not, you know, millions of years old that we find people that look like us. No. Uh -uh. And, you know, so, so we shouldn't take our diversity too seriously. Um, that's why when I was talking about the APOL, that stuff is no more than 4,000 years old, you know, and it's, it's microevolution. It's not real evolution. It's microevolution. It doesn't separate people out in terms of different species. It's below the species level. So it's, it's way fuzzier. Um, now, back to the commercial companies. The commercial companies have evolved, and some are getting much better. There's no problem with the science of 23andMe ancestry. You know, the big boys, they do excellent pipetting. They use the databases that are available, but we need, we scientists need to hold up our end and broaden the databases so that they have more for comparative purposes. So the fault, if there's any fault, I would say that it rests with the field scientists, the biologists who are out in the field that um, um, we shouldn't be so lazy that we think a trip to Africa means going to the refrigerator and pulling out some samples from 20 years ago. <laughs> we have a couple of jokes about that. What a molecular biologist thinks a trip to Africa is, is exactly. turning around and opening the freezer, you know? <laughs> but but, but we, we can do better and we have to consciously do better. And it has to become a priority for us as, as a society because truthfully, we're all in this together. And I'll give you a, a quick example. We keep talking about going to, the, to Mars, right? Go to Mars, let's go to Mars. Let's get on you know, SpaceX and go to Mars, except Mars has a whole lot of radiation. So we could not survive in our current form on Mars. <clears throat> we don't have enough epidermal melanin to protect us from the solar radiation of Mars. <laughs> so we're gonna to have to transform ourselves. You know, we're gonna to have to change our phenotypes if we're going to survive on Mars. So this is why it's not good to have too much commitment to any particular, you know, phenotype, whether you're in the Proud Boys or Aryan Nation, it's all stupid. It's, a, it's all a bad idea because that phenotype works in one setting, you change the setting, and now it's no longer adaptive. So we realize that we're going to have to change to survive on Mars 
or any other planet that we hope to colonize. And if we don't watch out, we're going to have to change ourselves to continue to survive on Earth because we're making some serious alterations to the ecosystems of Earth and making a sixth extinction eminently possible, eminently. And what are we going to do without adequate food, without adequate water, you know, with perpetual warfare? We're just not built for that. And so, so you know, having said that, the challenges are right in front of us if we just open our eyes. Thank you. Yeah, very, very helpful. Uh, let me build off of one question here. Um, there, there's a tendency in what a modern American culture to uh, think of African American as sort of a monolithic um, identity. And you, you've uh, suggested otherwise, I think in your slides, you were talking about uh, population structures mm -hmm. in the old world in, in uh, Africa, particularly along the Western coast, but uh, in very, really across the continent, mm -hmm. uh, even Mozambique. Uh, population structures that um, are, th are present there, mm -hmm. even if not well understood. But maybe you could, maybe you could help the non-scientists here uh, help me understand what we would mean by that. I assume we're talking about um, um, frequency, uh, allele frequencies that are different in one place as opposed to another. Yes. Um, but then, but then tie that to the um, uh, to, to the uh, uh, diaspora, the, the 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 transfer to the new world. And one part that I found absolutely fascinating was your suggestion that if you were to look at um, populations along, let's say, the lower Mississippi, mm -hmm. as opposed to the Carolina coast, mm -hmm. as opposed to, let's say, the Baltimore region, mm -hmm. you could see an echo of that structure that pre-exists. Yeah. Did, I, did I follow yeah. that correctly? Sure. Well, I'd never thought about that. I'd been guilty of this monolithic approach to, well, African Americans are African Americans, maybe with other stuff mixed in, but the, 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 the ancestral continental uh, population structures, that somehow uh, never really occurred to me, uh, but maybe you could say more about that. Sure. Well, we, we realized that African Americans are an amalgamation of African peoples. Right. And the, so the mixtures are going to be slightly different 300 years ago because of different groups coming into different catchment areas. Um, but then we've had so many migrations, including the Great Migration of 1910 to 1970s, where six million people moved from the South to the North and the West. <laughs> so, so in that time frame, there's additional opportunities for, for mixing of, popu of populations in spite of segregation. The mixing of Africans with Africans was pretty dynamic in terms of mixing up uh, producing phenotypes that had not been seen before. Um, but because of the political and economic system in this country, we've tended to, to paint all African people with a broad brush. And, and we've done that for white Americans too. So white Americans, European Americans, as I like to call them, European Americans have been detribalized as well. And it was a conscious effort to say, you're not German, you are American. Repeat after me, I pledge allegiance to the, you know? And for African-Americans, it was a conscious effort to detribalize because tribalization was the initial basis, John Henry Clark tells us, for many of the rebellions. Because of course, enslavement is not a natural process. Nobody wants to be enslaved. And every generation is born free and born with this idea that they're free. So they're going to unite and, and find ways to repel oppression because oppression is antithetical to the human spirit, regardless of what color or, 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 or gender you are. It's, it's antithetical to our spirits and we will fight it to the death. So <clears throat> um, having said that, I think that this detribalization process uh, plus the, the structured mating practices 
that were enacted during the time of enslavement um, really mitigated against retaining those African identities. Because, you know, it, it didn't matter if you said, but I'm a Hausa who studied at Timbuktu and, and I have a master's degree in Islamic studies, you're still getting beat down, <laughs> you know? And so here were all of these Africans from different parts of this huge continent thrown together in a common condition of enslavement. And they had to learn to communicate. They had to learn all of the foreignness that was being imposed upon them. And that's why I point to the resilience of the population. And part of that resilience was the admixture that, that at some point, uh, and uh, my, the historian, great historian, Mike Gomez at NYU write, writes about this. And he said that at some point, the, the population realized that it didn't matter if you were Igbo or Yoruba, or if you had beef with the Sokoto people, that, that none of that mattered in America. What mattered was your common lot as as darker people, and that was a a a, a sign that you were to be enslaved, and your children, and your grandchildren, and your great grandchildren. So that's that's a um, that's one heck of a liability to carry around, and and yet people persevered, and I think for that we have their belief systems to thank because it certainly wasn't the science because as Dr. O'Malley pointed out, the science was working against them. The science was not working on behalf of people of color, but their belief systems suggested to them that they were still people of merit, people of worth, you know? And, and that's why I say, if we look in our hearts today, you know, and, and keep balancing our science with our belief systems that um, we don't have to find absolute concordance, but we have to realize that the belief system and the science operate in different but overlapping domains. And where that, there is that thin area of overlap, you know, that that's where one can inform the other. And, and, but both inform the totality of our existence as, as scientists and humanists, you know? The next question um, that has surfaced in some of the comments here, but uh, also occurred to me as you were speaking, um, ha has to do with uh, what you termed uh, legacy African-Americans. And I, if you could just say another word about that. I mean, technically, how, how are you using that phrase? But you're referring, I think, to the Gullah as sort of the icon of um, a, a, a legacy yeah. African-American population. And, and by that, I assume you mean that here is a, a um, continuous population in which there has been um, some sealing off from some of this admixture mm -hmm. process of the last 100, 150 years at least, mm -hmm. some sealing off from that. Um, but but the, one of the questions asked about, um, uh, about, about the plight of the Gullah uh, in terms, I mean, you referenced uh, Hilton Head, uh, people kind of, uh, people coming in with lots of money and yeah. Right. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, any thoughts on that whole uh, range of uh, of questions? So, legacy African Americans are well. I'm a legacy African American. My my grandparents and great grandparents and great grandparents were all born here in the Americas. Right. And um, we know from genetic testing that they came from Africa. And, and we know that they came from a variety of places in Africa. Um, we know that there is, that, that like most legacy African-Americans, I have probably about 30% European ancestry, uh, have maybe two or 3% Native American ancestry. The bulk of my ancestry is from Africa. So 
you know, but, but what makes me a legacy African-American as opposed to someone who just came over on the ship from, or the boat from Nigeria, is that I've gone through, and my ancestors have gone through the experience of racism and segregation and slavery. And each of those experiences has left an impact, imprint on my genome through the epigenome. And we've done some studies looking at epigenomic retentions as a result of chattel slavery and uh, institutionalized racism. We actually even published on this and found that, that um, based upon the quality of care that uh, enslaved Africans receive, uh, the, the, the impact on their epigenomes of enslavement, that the impact may have been tremendous, but they were able to pass on some of those markers for up to four generations. So for someone as old as I am, I have great, great grandparents who were enslaved. So I'm carrying some of their genetic markers and, and some of their epigenetic markers. Now I can change these markers through dietary intervention and drug intervention and so forth. So it's possible to change some of the markers, but the fact that I've inherited them is a part of being a legacy African-American, as opposed to someone who just came, you know, just came from Ethiopia, looks like me, speaks like me, but has a whole different set of epigenomic markers and a different microbiome because they haven't been eating what I've been eating. <laughs> uh oh, Ron, your 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 volume. Mm -hmm. Thank thank you, uh -huh. uh, thank you uh, for that answer. I, one questioner asks, uh, what you might know about comparable studies involving populations in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that? Oh, sure. The research is not as well developed in those areas as in the United States. Right. I mean, I mean, we're the big dog in the Western Hemisphere, right? But they're coming along. And Brazil has very interesting stories because more Africans were brought to Brazil than the United States. In fact, the United States, North America, is a very exceptional case only less than 400,000 Africans were brought to North America, whereas millions went to Brazil and you know, to Mexico and, you know, and to Central America. So those stories have yet to be told, but they are very interesting and in how the people have adjusted, adapted, and, and survived in those settings is going to be very interesting. Uh, one of the stories I can tell you about uh, the uh, Brazilian experience, and in fact, the South American experience, is that um, we used to wonder in the scientific community, how did all of these African cultivars come to the New World? And the question was, how did they get there? Well, apparently, on the, the slave ships, many times the women the African women who were enslaved, but they were employed and they were forced to cook. <laughs> Some things never change. Okay, so they were forced to cook. So they're cooking and they and the, the slave ship owners have loaded African staples on the ships. The African women are cooking these for the men down below in the hull, as well as for the crew, uh, the European crew. And as the, when the women who were on the top deck could see the land, they would put the seeds into their hair. So they had the unhulled rice, put that in their hair. The, the cow peas, put it in their hair. The idea was, and this is beautiful, resilience, they said, we see land. When we land, we're gonna run. Either we'll have something to eat or we'll have something to plant. <coughs> so that, <coughs> I tell that story to my students and I remind them 
that if they didn't have if they didn't have kinky hair, they wouldn't have been able to hold the seeds because the seeds would have fallen out with those straight wigs that too many of our girls are wearing. <laughs> Wrong kind of hair. So the kinky hair holds the seeds, they put it in their hair, and then they could run un unfettered from the ship. And in fact, some of the early ships, slave ships, when they docked in South America, the Africans said, we know this environment. They knew it better than the Europeans who were, who were, who were their masters on the slaves, slave ships. And they ran into the forest, into the tropical rainforest, not to be seen of again for, for years, sometimes decades. <coughs> So uh, I'm, I'm monitoring the questions. We still have time, and maybe for one additional question, um, uh, I can think of two uh, and, and, uh, th that I could pose at this point, uh, but maybe one additional uh, that has yet to be written. Uh, the two that I'm thinking of, I, the first one is a kind of a technical medical question. You, you spent time talking to us about chronic kidney disease. Um, I'm assuming that that's one example among many, many yes. of the ways in which your research should be informing medical research for the benefit of all Americans. Is Correct. That, Correct. Yes. So Correct. Uh, without going down a long list, I, I mean, if you, you maybe could give us another or two or three examples of, uh, of, of, of blind spots in medicine, because we don't take this um, uh, the African uh, genetic legacy uh, as seriously as we should. Sure. Uh, one very good example is with sickle cell. Yes, right. So sickle cell, just about everybody knows about sickle cell and mm -hmm. it's a, a potential to, to uh, forestall uh, severe malaria, uh, falciparum malaria. And uh, what we found, I did my dissertation work in Liberia even though I had spent three years in Tanzania, it was what I was talking with Rob about, our Tanzanian connection. <clears throat> but in Liberia, in West Africa, um, I did my dissertation work looking at genetic adaptations to malaria and saw that um, the uh, people who had sickle cell, if they also had high levels of fetal hemoglobin, they didn't have the serious phenotypic effects, the, the soreness in the limbs, they didn't have the high levels of anemia because that gene-gene interaction between the gene products of elevated fetal hemoglobin and the gene products of sickle cell, they kind of cancel each other out a little bit. So lo and behold, that knowledge allowed us, once, we, once scientists develop CRISPR-Cas9 uh, genetic engineering to intervene by modifying the gene that suppresses the fetal hemoglobin gene so that fetal, the, the people with sickle cell will continue to produce fetal hemoglobin. That's the basis of the genetic engineering of sickle cell using CRISPR-Cas9. But it's all based on something that was already happening under natural conditions in Africa because a certain proportion of the population was producing elevated levels of fetal hemoglobin way into adulthood. They never did turn off their fetal hemoglobin production the way the rest of us have, you know, but it served them well. It meant that their sickle cell was tolerable and they could, um, they still retain some protection against malaria, but they also did not suffer from sickle cell anemia. You know, so that was where knowledge of what was going on in Africa provided a template for intervening using our fancy dancy Western tools, you know, but you have to, before, before, when we were doing genetic engineering, without tying it back to evolutionary medicine, we were killing people. So, in fact, they called a moratorium on the genetic engineering that was being done without benefit of 
a, a historical context. <clears throat> so I believe that as we search for more understand uh, and greater understanding of the genetic variants from Africa and how how the populations of Africa have managed to survive in spite of these variations or sometimes because of these variations, it's going to upgrade our knowledge of evolutionary science. And we'll be better scientists, we'll be, make, we'll be better able to make meaningful interventions without harming people. Um, and it, I believe in the end, it will begin to bring us together as a species because the answer to, to some disorder that I have may not rest necessarily in Africa. It may be in Africa, but the answer may be in China. <laughs> we have a saying in Islam that says, seek knowledge uh, to the ends of the earth, even if you have to go to China. And China was seen as the ends of the earth. Well, you know, so you, wh wherever the knowledge is, that's what, where we have to go to understand the conditions that, that uh, will improve our status on this planet. Thank you so much. That's a, just a really terrific note on which to end this conversation. We've gone a, a little bit over time with your indulgence. I appreciate it very much and I appreciate you. the uh, audience staying with us uh, through to this point. Uh, but you, you said that um, the uh, br bringing these perspectives on board with the latest um, efforts in science is, is really a life and death issue. It's, it's, oh, yes. uh, uh, we, we need that wisdom Yes. Uh, to guide the uh, precision medicine of the future. Uh, exactly. Is, uh, and that brings me back to um, what was so striking about your final slide, your response to Phyllis Wheatley. Um, I, that, that, that final sentence really uh, touched me at the time because it, 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 it suggested to me that you have a deep faith, not just in humanity and not just in your own calling, as as a uh, as a as a, a woman of faith and of science, but um, in the science itself to uh, advance humanity and advancing humanity to somehow bring us more closely together into a common shared humanity. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. That's why I believe so much in the science that I feel it wasn't just that I received excellent training at Cornell, you know, but it was also something instilled in me by, you know, my professors and the said that, that if you understood a problem, maybe it's my logical positivism, but if you understand a problem and you have good intentions, God will find a way, Allah will find a way to make the truth evident to you. Right. And so I, I, I realize that a lot of what I work on is hard science. A lot of it is also faith for the, for the gapping areas where we don't have the science yet. But I'm, I'm a logical positivist in thinking that we, if I keep trying, we will develop the science and then that will open up new areas of inquiry. So there'll always be a space for the wonderment of belief of mm. religious belief, but mm. they'll also, but that's not an excuse to not do the science. That's <laughs> a reason to do the science. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Amen, amen. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Fatima Jackson has been speaking with us about a very complex and um, uh, difficult topic. Uh, thank you also to uh, Rob O'Malley uh, for your, 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 your beautiful intervention, your comments, and your opening up of the, of the uh, scope of what we were uh, thinking about tonight.